Let us pray together. Be with us this morning, God. Quiet our hearts. May our spirits be still that we might hear from you. Amen. As we pick up in today's passage from the Gospel of John, Jesus, knowing He's about to be betrayed and crucified, knowing that His time with His disciples is drawing to a close, here now He is in the middle of an extended prayer for His disciples, His final prayer with His disciples. And here He's praying that in His absence, God will bless them. That they might come to enjoy the same unity with God's Spirit that Jesus Himself enjoys. That they, like He, might also be sanctified, He says, by the word of truth. And then He prays this, And I ask not only on behalf of these disciples, but also on behalf of those that will believe through their word. This is such a remarkably powerful verse, such a remarkably powerful phrase, that I personally find it almost a dizzying to consider its significance. Through their word, I ask also on behalf of those who will believe through their word. That prayer was spoken some 2,000 years ago. And it was spoken over just 12 men. 12 very young men, mind you. Most, if not all of whom, coming from families of no clout, no reputation. And yet here we are. Over 6,000 miles from where that prayer was offered. Some 2,000 years later, gathered together in that same man's name in Corbin, Kentucky, in the year 2016. How was this even possible? How did this come to pass? Here's how it came to pass it came to pass through their word. Do you follow? Am I the only one who finds this remarkable? That my very identity as a Christian is necessarily traced back to one of these 12 men. That somehow all the various things that came to pass for my becoming a person of faith are necessarily linked back to that very prayer. That 2,000 years later, through the word of just 12 young fishermen, 2.2 billion people alive today are still calling their leader Lord and are still attempting to carry out the very same commission that He gave them. It's amazing when you stop to think about it. Truly mind-boggling literally miraculous. And thus it goes to show just how much power the word of truth carries. That word of truth Jesus prayed in today's passage that His disciples like He might not only have, but be courageous enough to share. It goes to show how the word of truth, unlike words of sophistry and flattery and hollow promises, it goes to show how the word of truth can cut through all corrupt power and all false pretense. It goes to show how the word of truth can cut through hardened hearts and blinded eyes and closed ears. Which is to say it goes to show how the word of truth can transform the world. And don't think for one second that that's not every bit as applicable today as it was back then. Take, for example, last year's shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. 
As you'll recall, in June of last year, a young man named Dylan Roof went into the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, took part in a Bible study with members of the congregation, and then as the study drew to a close, pulled out a gun and proceeded to kill nine people. Roof was a white man. And days later, authorities found a manifesto he had written wherein he talked about the incidents that led to his becoming, quote, racially aware, and ultimately about how he believed blacks had to be stopped from taking over the country. Along with that manifesto, numerous incendiary photos of Roof were found, the most notable, of course, being the one where he poses with a Confederate flag. And that photo, as we all know, led to a controversy about that flag, which still exists to this very moment. And here's why I bring it up today. It was in a discussion about that flag that a longtime friend of mine said to me, you know, Austin, racism does exist. And it's not just a problem. It's a sin. And here's what's significant about his having said that to me. That same friend had for years argued that deep-seated racism was merely a thing of the past. And relatedly, that the Confederate flag was merely a symbol of heritage. But this event with Dylan Roof had changed his mind. And significantly, and to the point, what had changed his mind what had led to his recognition that racism is still a tremendous problem, and that whether we like it or not, the Confederate flag stands out as a symbol of that problem, what had led to his recognition of these facts was not the obvious racism that had led to Dylan Roof's singular event. It was not the racist manifesto that Roof had left behind. It was not even the blatantly racist rhetoric that came from those who inexplicably tried to argue that what Dylan Roof had done was not actually about racism. Instead, what changed his mind was the response that that church made in the shooting's aftermath. In the face of such unspeakable evil, in the wake of the brutal killing of nine members of that church, their pastor included, that church publicly and sincerely forgave Dylan Roof his trespass and likewise forgave him for the racial views which had given rise to it. And here's the thing. As they did, they cited their Christian faith as that which both taught them and enabled them to forgive. Now, was this a remarkable act of forgiveness? You better believe it was. But it was more than that. It was the very word of truth. Suddenly speaking across all of our news channels with a megaphone. And the power of that word swept across our country. It touched our hearts and it transformed lives. And I know this because my longtime friend was one of those who was transformed. That church's act of forgiveness drew him back into the Christian church and it opened his eyes to the continued injustice that is racism in our world. For 30 plus years he'd seen the issue differently. In the end, it wasn't through argument that he came to change his mind. It wasn't through facts and statistics. It wasn't even through the Charleston tragedy itself, horrific as that was. He came to change his mind through that church's word in response to it. And in that way, he's not at all unlike the prison guard in today's passage from Acts. In this passage, Paul and Silas have been thrown in prison for being societal agitators. Disturbances, the text calls them. And when we readers first meet this prison guard, he's diligently watching the prison doors in complete agreement with the authorities that Rome is better off without these agitators walking the streets, without their stirring people up with their talk of religious and political dissidents. Well, that's until the power of God suddenly shakes the prison foundation 
and opens wide the prison doors and gives all the prisoners an opportunity to run free. But then he hears a call from Paul and Cyrus. And there they still sit. Why would they do this? The prison guard wonders. Why wouldn't they flee when they have the chance? So suddenly this prison guard's eyes are opened because he sees the way that fear has no power over them. He sees the way that whatever power he has is completely superseded by whatever power it is that they have. And it changes him. And so he asks them, what must I do to have that? And they speak to him the word of truth. And thus the passage ends by saying that he and his whole household became believers in God. How did this happen? How did Paul and Silas accomplish this? They accomplished it the same way that that church in Charleston accomplished what they did. They accomplished it the same way those first 12 disciples accomplished what they did. That is to say, they accomplished it through the power of their word. In Isaiah chapter 55, God says through the prophet, My word will never return to me void, but will accomplish that which I purpose, and will succeed in the thing for which I send it. In the beginning, that word created the heavens and the earth. And in the fullness of time, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And just before that word returned to his father, he prayed over 12 young fishermen. And he prayed that that word might be in them. That through them that word might pervade the whole world. And then when he finished praying for them, he prayed for all those who would believe through their word. Well, their word spread across all of Judea. And then it spread across all of Palestine. And then it spread across the entire Roman Empire. And eventually it spread across all the world. It was through their word that that Roman prison guard came to believe. It was through their word that you and I came to believe. It was through their word that a church in Charleston found, found the courage to forgive a crazed young man for holding a crazed old idea. And thus it was through their word that my lifelong friend came to change his mind about the horror that is racism. My word will never return to me void, saith the Lord but will accomplish that which I purpose and will succeed in the thing for which I send it. These words are true. You want to know how I know they're true? Because each of us stands here today as testament to it. We all believe through their word which then leaves one question before us. Who then will believe through our word? Whose heart will be changed? Whose life will be transformed through our grace? Through our love? Through our courage? Through our forgiveness? Who will come to believe through our word? Because if that word be the word of truth, we can know this. That word will never return to God void. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.